there and the buds are swelling and feel so good today. I'm blessed to be able to work in the Northwest. Northwest is the best for the trees around the Wissahickon and in the area. And we uh, at John B. Ward are just uh, thrilled to be working with the community to support the conservancy, uh, to encourage green and healthy trees and landscape. We are proud to support the Conservancy's mission and its work to sustain the area's natural and built environment and share its history and programs like this evening's lecture. Lori Salganikoff, it's up to you now. Thank you, and good job pronouncing my name there, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your support of this wonderful program. Um, hello and welcome everyone. I'm Lori Salganikoff, Executive Director of the Chestnut Hill Conservancy, an educational center and advocate for the architecture, open space, and history of Chestnut Hill and surrounding communities in the Wissahickon watershed and along the train lines. I am here today with Chrissy Clausen, our program and communications manager, who along with co-chairs Jean McCubrey and Susan Peck and the rest of their program committee, helped organize tonight's Discovering Chestnut Hill program with our esteemed speaker. I should mention that although the Conservancy's tour and lecture series is titled Discovering Chestnut Hill, we often cover topics of broader geographical interest. We are so grateful to the leaders of the Save the Train effort Happy to see so many in the audience this evening and proud to be a part of that effort. We are also gr grateful to all of you for taking the time tonight to learn more about the rich background of the railroad system and its fundamental significance in the creation of the vibrant communities of the Northwest and rest of the Philadelphia area. Typically this tour and lecture series helps raise funds to support the conservancy but 100% of the proceeds from our train-centric programs tonight and later this spring will be added to our contributions to the Save the Train effort. You can learn more about these and other conservancy programs at the web on our website. And uh, I have also put the Save the Train link in the uh, chat as, in addition to the conservancy's website. Before we hear from our railroad historian, Ted Zaras, we've invited Bob Previtti, a chestnut hiller with a background in transit and transportation and transport policy to describe the Save the Train organization, underscore the importance of revitalizing investment and train ridership in our community, and share how you can contribute time, treasure, or whatever else may help. As I said, the webpage link for Save the Train is in the chat. And after Bob speaks, our fabulous archivist, Alex Bartlett, will introduce this evening's speaker, Ted Zaras. Please make sure that you have muted yourself. We invite you to add any questions you have during the program in the chat for the question and answer session that will follow the lecture and that will be moderated by Jean McCubrey. Many of the Conservancy's public programs are free or offered at a low cost because of the support of our generous sponsors, such as J.B. Ward, members and supporters. Our members receive discounts to these programs, such as tonight's program, and their support, your support, provides critical funding for the Conservancy's work. If you're not a member, I hope you will join. I will now turn the unmute button over to our archivist, Alex Bartlett, to introduce our speaker, Ted Zaras. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Lori. I'd like to introduce uh, Ted Zaris, who is a renowned artist and educator, passionate about arts, art, and railroads. Born in Upper Darby, Ted's fascination with art and railroads was sparked by his father, who worked at the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Eddystone during Ted's formative years. Encouraged by his parents, Ted pursued his artistic talents and graduated from Upper Darby Senior High School in 1963 before attending the Philadelphia College of Art where he majored in illustration and graduated in 1967. Following a brief stint as an illustrator in New York, <clears throat> Ted was drafted into the armory in February 1968 and served two years in Germany. 
During his service, he married Judy, who shared his passion for art. After completing his military service, Ted earned his master's in fine art at Tyler School of Art from 1970 to 72. He then embarked on a distinguished career in education, teaching at the College of Arts Continuing Education Program and later serving as a full-time faculty member at Ursinus College from 1973 to 2007, where he chaired the art department. In 2008, Ted transitioned to teaching at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts Continuing Education Program, specializing in portrait painting until his retirement last year. Throughout his teaching career, Ted continued to pursue his artistic endeavors, producing commissioned portraits and paintings of railroad subjects. Ted's artistic talent extends beyond the canvas as he and his wife, Judy, are avid collectors interested in history and art. While Ted collects railroad artifacts and ephemera, Judy focuses on antique Christmas ornaments and ephemera, as well as garden ornamentation and nature. Currently residing in Lansdowne, Ted and Judy share their home with their beloved cats, Ketty and Patty. Ted's latest railroad paintings, capturing the former Baltimore and Ohio passenger station in Philadelphia, showcase his enduring passion for art and history. So without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Ted Zaris. Ted, thank you so much. Take it away. All right, you want me to get started, Laurie? Yes. All right, uh, hello everybody. Before Ted gets started, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction about the work of the Save the Train effort and thank you all for showing uh, so much interest. Um, the Chestnut Hill East and West lines are, are, a, are what made Chestnut Hill what it is today. Next. And uh, last year SEPTA issued what they uh, if a map on the right that would be a doomsday scenario if they're not able to get um, the budget numbers that they require for service. And you'll notice that on, on this particular map, both the Chestnut Hill East and Chestnut Hill West lines are completely carved out. And I want to explain a little bit about what's going on. Next. There's been a long-term trend in uh, ridership going down. It's been going on for a while since the recovery of the 2008 crisis. Uh, as, as the economy got better, more people buy cars and less people use transit. And then we really took a hit come COVID. Next. We have started to see a bounce back. Here's, a, here's some ridership data showing on the 23 route, a dramatic drop in ridership because of COVID. And it's been creeping up, creeping back slowly. Next. Axios has reported that uh, Philadelphia's metro area has is, is operating at about 45% of pre-pandemic ridership levels. Next. Why does this matter? Well, we live in the great Northwest. It's a beautiful area. And we certainly believe in a clean environment. So I would think that um, you know, being able to, to really raise awareness about this issue and have everybody realize that our ridership is really down and it's, it, we can ask for more money from Harrisburg, but I'm going to show you some ridership numbers that are alarming. We really need to try to get people back to riding the train. Next. Um, it's been reported on a lot. The Philadelphia Business uh, Journal has reported on it. Uh, the buses have recovered a little bit better than the rail. They're at about 75% of 219 ridership. Next. And uh, other cities have also employed a lot of creative ways to try to to try to get ridership back. Some have been more successful uh, than others. I was out in Los Angeles recently, and and uh, right after COVID, and they actually made the buses free for a period of time to try to get people back. And I have to tell you, I was in LA for a week without a car, and it was pretty marvelous to just be able to jump on any bus to get where I wanted to go. Next. The crisis is, I would summarize it as this, it's a $240 million hole. 
And the bottom line is it's, you know, we probably will be able to, through our advocacy, uh, plug that hole this year. But we really, in the long run, need to figure out how to get people back onto riding the trains, back onto riding the bus. I take the 23 bus all the time, back and forth to Mount Airy, Germantown. It runs every 10 minutes. It's fabulous. And I would encourage people, if you haven't gotten your senior card, if you're 65 and older, get it. You get to ride for free. We need the ridership numbers. But also, a lot of us have cars. We have an easy pass. Um, we don't think about what it costs. Maybe if you are just an occasional user, you want to make it easier on yourself, you want to help SEPTA, get the monthly pass for SEPTA so that you don't have to think about it. Make it easy on yourself to be able to choose taking SEPTA. Next. And here's the ridership numbers that, uh, to me, are, are extremely alarming. The average daily ridership on the Chestnut Hill West is 1,752 a day. And on the Chestnut Hill East, about 1,500 a day. Now, prior to this, each line was carrying around 6,000 people a day. I want to give you a general sense of how alarming this is. I'm a, I'm a former transit planner at New York City Transit. And if you've ever taken the number seven train out to the US Open or to City Field in New York, that one line, the number seven train, moves about 600,000 people a day. That's more than all of the regional rail system, all of the subway system, all of the trolley system, and all of the bus system here in Philadelphia. One line. We are not using this tremendous resource that is SEPTA nearly as much as we could. And these numbers are, if this continues to stay this way, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this fight continues. We need, I cannot stress enough, we need to get people to wake up or we're gonna lose this fantastic resource. Next. And again, I wanna stress, um, monthly uh, SEPTA is seeing about 20, was seeing 29 million riders a month. It's now down to 13 million riders a month. We have a long way to climb back. Next. And, um, this is a good chart that somebody made for us here at, the, at our group. We used to have 38 trains a day on the West, and now we're down to 25 trains a day. You know, and next, if you go to the next slide, you know, again, the budgetary hole, what's in green here is what the fare pays for. People don't realize that these agencies don't, the public transit agencies don't make money. The rider is expected to pay a little bit more, we all pay. Uh, we all pay on taxes uh, a, a certain amount, but if you're a rider, you pay a little bit more. Um, but it ranges between uh, 25 and 50 percent of what it costs uh, to to that, that that is what you pay. Next. But what we're worried about now is the death spiral, because if you see if ridership falls and then service gets cut and and jobs get cut, and then the fare goes up, and then the ridership collapses, we're, we're on a death spiral. We, we need to figure out how to turn this death spiral around. Next. And this is just some more about what SEPTA has put out about what they, what we're lobbying in Harrisburg, stating some of these facts that, you know, if you lose a transit system, that, you know, it really hurts our ability to attract jobs and then we end up losing jobs. Then we end up having a smaller tax base. It really, it hurts us all around. Next. So right now we've got 7,000, more than 7,000 people who have signed up, uh, 68 organizations and growing. We've got a lot of elected officials paying attention to us. Uh, we're having a major event on Monday. Uh, you're all invited to attend. You can sign up at our website. Monday, March 18th, we're taking the first Chestnut Hill West train down to 38th Street. We're going to grab the 720 train out to Harrisburg. We're going to meet, meet with Senator Art Haywood on the steps of the uh, Rotunda, and we're going to have a press conference announcing and, 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 and visiting with legislators to say, look, we need you to save the train. And we're also doing our part as this, uh, our new poster is going to say, you know, we got to use it or lose it. And we've 
we hope that uh, you'll join us in our fight. And uh, and uh, uh, if you have questions, I'll be staying on and, and be available at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, so much. Now we um, are delighted to hear from Ted Zaras. All right. So uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, and thanks to Alex for his introduction and Bob and Save the Train for all they do to save these irreparable stations. Um, I must say, Bob's speech was so powerful, I don't know how I can even continue after that. What I really need is a good stiff drink. But anyway, uh, tonight we will uh, step back in time and embark on a captivating journey from the Northwest Philadelphia to Cheston Hill. And we, I want to do this like a time travel. So we'll, we're, we're using the timetable, and at every stop, we'll talk about the history that uh, surrounds that. And we'll discover how both Cheston Hill West and East contributed to the development of these special communities, including the iconic places that have played roles in shaping and serving Cheston Hill today. I want to start with the Cheston Hill East because it's older. That's the latest timetable. And uh, now, amazingly, 200, almost 200 years ago, in three more years, it'll be 200 years, 1827, there was a small railroad up in the coal regions in um, a place called Jim Thor. Well, it was called Mort Chunk. Now, now it's Jim Thor. And um, they uh, tapped the mines there and they built a small railroad, which is the first one in Pennsylvania and one of the first in the United States to bring the coal from the mines to um, the Lehigh River, where they had what that was called the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company Canal. And from there, they go down the Lehigh River and then eventually down the Delaware and on and on and on. The, um, it was called the Switchback Railroad. And Edward Bonsall, who's a businessman in Germantown, had heard about this and he invited his friend uh, Joseph Lieber, who is from uh, the, the Moravian community in Bethlehem, to go up there with some citizens from Germantown and check it out. And he said, oh, if only we could have something like that in Germantown. If there was a way to bring coal. Now, you have to remember something. Coal, at that time, is the prime mover of the Industrial Revolution. If you weren't near water power, you had to use coal to fire furnaces and uh, making iron and, and almost everything else. And this was anthracite coal, by the way. It's a little bit cleaner burning than soft coal. In any case, uh, so they set out a survey. But what, the one thing he wanted to make sure of, though, is that that railroad would go through Germantown. This is very important. So they, they did a survey. And they had what they called the northern route and the southern route. They weren't really very far apart. The northern route went through Germantown itself. So all the way from the coal re regions down through Plymouth Meeting and Norristown, all the way to Germantown and then into Philadelphia. But when the surveyors got a little bit beyond Germantown, uh, to be specific, beyond Vernon Park, they said, you'll never do it on this route because the, uh, the topography is too rough. You'll never get a train to pull anything over that. Let's use the Southern route for that part of it. And it's easy and it's still there. And that's the, uh, that's basically the line along the Schuylkill River. It still runs. Although they're not pulling coal down there. I will tell you that. In any case, but uh, Bonsall was really reluctant to give up the German town. In fact, if you'll notice in early railroading and even canal building, the entrepreneurs always want to make sure that the railroad or the canal goes through where they live, okay? And we all know why that is. Okay, but I'm glad he did. And so they have the railroad going from 9th and Green in Philadelphia to Germantown Avenue and Price. It's only about six miles and it stub ends and it doesn't go beyond Germantown Avenue. Oh, but to back up one more time, You'll notice there's a spot called intersection on the map. 
intersection, that's the, the part that swings off onto the Norristown route. And that, that's another story for another time. But we're just going to focus on the part from Philadelphia to uh, Germantown. And then Chestnut Hill. So in June of 1832, uh, the very first train made the trip, and they were actually pulled by horses initially. And they were telling you there, the guests were furnished with tickets. They all took seats, 20 gentlemen only being placed in each car. I guess they didn't want to overcrowd them. In any case, Everybody who was anybody showed up because this was like the biggest deal that had ever happened in Germantown. And you have to remember something that before that, the only way to get to Germantown was by stagecoach. They had a two horse coach or a four horse coach, and they were going at an average of about four miles an hour. Next. In November, the first steam locomotive was hooked onto the train. And what's interesting about this, you have the first railroad in Philadelphia pulled by the first steam locomotive in Philadelphia and the first steam locomotive built in Philadelphia by Matthias Baldwin. Um, and um, it was called Old Ironsides. The amazing thing is on that first trip, he actually managed to make up to 28 miles an hour at a certain point in time. And I was thinking about it recently. I only found that out a little while ago. 28 miles an hour is probably not that much different from one of the commuter trains even now. In any case, that's an aside. Uh, now, that building on the left, it looks really more like an inn, almost like a Conestoga inn. Because at that time, there were no railroad stations to model. They, they took inns and, and highway, what was then called highway structures or canal structures. And that was the model for station structure then. In 1851, however, they built that large station that you see on the right, which for a short time was the largest railroad station in the United States. And it was at Ninth and Green. Um, now, a uh, wonderful shot on the street later though, close to 1900. But there you can see the train running on the street. And um, that's 9th Street. Now, believe it or not, when you ride today, you're, you're still on that right of way, but you're about 20 feet above the ground. But at that time, you'll notice houses had been developed along those years. They had a 70 foot wide road and the, the railroad occupied the center. But Philadelphia, Germantown and Norristown is what it was called. There were industries all along there, coal yards, iron working places, and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at the photo on the right, it's, you know, pretty bland, but that is the site of where the Ninth and Green Depot stood from 1851 until about 1909. Um, behind it, if you were to poke around there, you will find the tunnel portal for the center city commuter tunnel. Uh, by the way, I was on the last train out of Reading Terminal and the very next day they opened the commuter tunnel. That was in 1984. Uh, it's hard to believe it's almost 40 years ago. Go ahead. Now on the left, you're gonna see the engine servicing terminal prior to 1910. It's all down on the grade level, a coal dock, water tanks, repair facilities, everything. It was actually on both sides of the track running up 9th Street. In 1910, they elevated the entire line, which by that time was coming out of Reading Terminal, and uh, eliminated almost every single grade crossing. In fact, I think in Philadelphia, every grade crossing was eliminated. And at that point, the Reading actually becomes a modern railroad. Right. Now, very hard to find photographs of the first generation of railroad stations, but that's one of them. Um, that was originally called Intersection. And then 16th Street and then 16th Street Junction. And there you see it much later in 1917, really in effect bypassed, but it was still standing. As a matter of fact, it's amazing. I saw it in a color slide in 1965, if you can believe it. It was still standing. I believe it is going now. But that's the junction much later in about 1885. But you can see the location of 16th Street Junction. Uh, you're a little bit west of Broad Street. 
near uh, North Philadelphia Station today. Another example, very rare, of a Philadelphia Germantown and Norristown station, and this is the pre reading era, is a nice town. You notice it's wooden clapboard. Now, later that was replaced and they elevated the track and they upgraded and everything else, but that's a rare photo. Moving further north to Fishers, um, you're actually seeing a building much more substantial uh, stone. Uh, and that was built in 1875 after the Reading Railroad, much larger. The Philadelphia Reading leased the Philadelphia German town in Ours Town. My photo on the right is in 1979, which is when I actually the first time started the slideshow of the Chesson Hill Railroad. We'll talk about that later, maybe. <laughs> okay, I just got this photo on the right two nights ago, and um, Chrissy wonderfully inserted into the show. I have looked for 45 years for a photo like that. I finally got it on eBay. But anyway, it shows Fishers down on the street level, and that's East Logan Street. You're looking towards the railroad because all my other shots had been on the track level. And I never could find one that showed the full three stories, but there it is. Okay, the wonders of eBay. By the way, I don't have the photo yet. They haven't, uh, it hasn't been delivered. I saved it to my computer, but we'll move on. Uh, wonderful shot there. You can see some of the decorative detail. That building stood till the very early 1980s. I'm afraid to say it's gone now. Um, one of the advantages of having started the slideshow in 1979, I actually managed to see some stations that are now gone. I'm not happy that they're going, but I'm glad I did see them. In any case, as you, uh, Fishers is, is really on the south end of the Worcester Woods, and on the north end is Worcester Station. Very famous family of Philadelphia was the Worcesters. It used to be called Dewey's Lane, and then it became Worcester. On the left, that's the 1898 station on the curve, and then much later, uh, much more simplified on the straightaway, but that's Worcester. That's more or less as you're getting ready to leave Germantown and moving into the, well, I guess you're still in Germantown. Uh, this one, the one on the left. That is one of my favorite photos of all time. Um, what that is, is Wingo Hawking. <clears throat> now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the centennial of 1876. And you have to remember when that was set up, it was in Fairmount Park even at that time, and the Fairmount Park commissioners stipulated that the fair would go on for the better part of the year. And when the fair was over, well, the original idea was that all buildings except for Memorial Hall and Horticultural Hall would be removed. I know the Ohio House is still there. I get it. But there were huge buildings, like the main hall, uh, you know, which was 1,776 feet long, I might add. In any case, they're all gone. But when they started to dismantle the fair, there were a lot of buildings up for grabs. And the Philadelphia Riding grabbed this one, and it was the women's kindergarten exhibit because they were exhibiting, you know, the most modern methods of teaching kindergarten kids at that time. And there it is to the right, right near the end in 1930 less some of the decorative detail, but watch this, you look at the interior shots. If you look very carefully at the leaded glass window, there's some images, I think, depicting childhood. And it's amazing that it was still intact as late as 1930. Uh, keep going, you can walk around the room and you can see the ticket office and all that wonderful woodwork, gabling, glazed brick, Magnificent, but oddly enough, remember, not built as a railroad station, but appropriated and used for many years. Okay. Now, Main Street Depot in Germantown. So that is, in fact, the stub end of the Philadelphia and Germantown and Norristown's railroad to Norristown, between Philadelphia and Norristown. And the photographer on the left is standing in Burning Park, which was there even then. And it says Main Street Depot or Main Street Station. And there it is on the right, 
I saw it in 1979. That was in September of 1979. And to me, that was what I call a piece of the true cross. You know, it has something so rare. For, you have to remember something. And, and that was that was the last station standing built by the Philadelphia German town of North. Side. I know Shawmont exists on the river line, I get it, but that was built as a house and then leased by the PGNN. This one was built for the PGNN and it was the last one left. 1855 it was built and this is an extremely rare photograph. The original, I believe, is in the Germantown Historical Society's archives. It's a very small cyanotype, if you're familiar with that kind of blue-green photograph. I have it transcribed here in the black and white, but that's a photo taken when it really was a real depot during the Civil War in 1862. And um, what can I say then and sort of, now, it's not really now because even my photo that I pull now is 45 years ago. You'll notice the arched windows are kind of a, a sort of an Italian Renaissance romantic revival. Very typical of the 1850s, it's sort of an Italian age. Now, later, from 1902 on, well, the station continued to be used for a while as a stub end, even after they built the Shelton Avenue one. But then in 1902, it was relegated to only handling coal traffic, coal cars, and a coal office. Now, on the right, the photograph is looking across Armat Street, the track swinging to the left, Right next to the tool shed is heading to the old right of way, and the track to the right is actually going to Chestnut Hill. As you pass under the train shed, you're going to Chestnut Hill. Here's the layout of the original Germantown depot that I just showed you built in 1855. There's a little roundhouse there, amazing. A little turntable and an engine, not a roundhouse, an engine house. Okay. This is in its final years as coal. Look at that, overgrown, but there's a couple of coal hoppers filled with coal, so they were still doing business, even as late as 1930. And I saw it finally in 1979. I went around back, right where the coal cars used to be, and there was the station, it was still there. So uh, it went down, unfortunately, I think in the very earliest part of 1981. I'll never forget the night Elizabeth Holloway, the late Elizabeth Holloway, used to be the archivist in Germantown. And she told me, I got bad news for you. It burned and it's gone. And uh, I should have taken more photographs. In any case, the, uh, the what replaced it is the Germantown station, but built by the Philadelphia Reading after the lease happened starting in December, 1870. Within a year or two, they built this, 1872, I think it is. And a very rare shot at the ticket office, interior. Okay. Now, you see the train shed there, and that's for the track that's really going to Chestnut Hill, although anybody can use it. And they're crossing, um, that's actually uh, Germantown Avenue. Mm -hmm. This is Chelton Avenue, looking into the station. That's in 1910, that's a wonderful shot. By the way, the crossing chaney for the gatekeeper, that's actually was added in the 1880s and that's a Frank Furness design. You'll be seeing him later. Um, on the right, the Draymond's wagon crossing uh, Germantown Avenue and the track that's right behind the barbershop curving away is going to Justin Hill. And on the left, that is the exact moment when they're in the process of elevating the track, eliminating the grade crossing, and then electrification in 1930. Next. And then you see it later, actually that shot's in 79 by me, the track curving away is going to Chester Hill. Now, Chester Hill. So when you go through the minute books, uh, and Alex allowed a friend of mine and I to have a lot of fun. I, I went through the end reports and my friend Chuck Denlinger went through the minute books and he came up upon this little gem and he photographed it. And that is the first mention 
of the idea of a railroad to Chapton Hill. A hundred dollars appropriated for exploring uh, for an extension of the railroad, meaning extending from Germantown towards Chestnut Hill. And that is in, um, I think it's October 1847. Okay. So a new railroad company, but controlled by the PGN was formed, and you can see it on the stock certificate, um, Chestnut Hill Railroad Company. Um, and if you read in the announcement, William Morris Esquire, the official president of the Germantown Railroad, he says, this road, when completed, will throw open a magnificent country to the citizens of Philadelphia for either permanent or summer residences. And then he says the road will run on the east side, meaning of Germantown Avenue. Well, it's amazing that all those years later, he was absolutely correct. That's exactly what happened. And we can live and see those houses today. Okay, now um, here we're talking about finishing the railroad and then a very early newspaper where they're talking about timetables. And it was amazing within days before they were opening. First they said, oh, we'll have about three trains a day. And by the time they opened it, they had to increase it to six. You know, now as uh, Bill is saying, how we're losing ridership. Ah, but in those days, they were gaining ridership faster than they could, they could even pull enough cars to pull them. Good. All right. So that's a very early timetable in the newspaper on and after Monday, July 3rd, 1854. Passenger trains. Now, remember, this is not primarily a freight road. This is all about transporting people. Oh, they did have freight. Make no mistake about it but it was primarily a passenger railroad. The photo on the right is not really designed as a railroad state. It's really an inn. It was at the stub end of the railroad. I, I can't prove it, but I think it was used by passengers when they got off the train. And that would represent really the first generation of stations, but it's really an inn on Bethlehem Pike. So, um, and just as they predicted, houses will be built. And people started moving up there, and you'll see two styles as we walk through those. There's the early, the Gothic style. That's the first manifestation of the Romantic era is the Gothic revival. And then the second one is what they call Italian villa or Italian age. And there's all kinds of examples of that. It, it just, we, some of them are still standing. Some of them are still standing. And I think, was that Liz's house? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, <laughs> magnificent. I must say I took that photo and I'm happy to took that photo. Uh, I didn't know whose house it was, by the way. I just thought it was a great house. But anyway, and there's the vistas they're talking about. You see that? Looking into the distance and they're still building. Now, as time goes on, uh, it I mean, it took years, of course, for it finally to be developed. Gothic style. You see that? Go ahead, next. Keep going. All right. Anyway, I'm sure you recognize many of these houses. A lot of them are still standing. And uh, I think you all know much more about them than I do. But that's okay. Yeah. Ah, one at least brief moment, because I could go into a lot about this, but I, I had to just make mention of the Mauer Army Hospital, the military hospital during the Civil War. It was opened in 1862, and it was on uh, Willow Grove Avenue. Uh, now I can't remember the exact parameters. I'm sure you do, because I, I checked it on my atlas, and you can see it. I think Stanton is part of it. But anyway, um, they were able to hold up to 6,000 wounded soldiers from the Civil War, mostly Union, but they even had a few Confederates ended up there. Um, in any case... Out of 20,000 soldiers that went through there, they actually only lost about less than 250 who died. That's actually a very good average. In fact, I don't know if today the ratio of wounded soldiers in a battlefield situation would be that kind of ratio now. They were very clean. and But what's also interesting, that's one of the very few images you can see the inset of a station that's pretty much on the site of Winmore today. Now, we move to the next phase 
of the Philadelphia and Reading. And is, at, this is the moment where the, the railroad really moves into the big league. And that's because I mentioned before that the Philadelphia and Reading leased the Philadelphia, Germantown, and Norristown in the summer of 1870. And from that moment on, um, they the, the Reading Railroad started to put substantial amounts of money into it. And so the two images there, Franklin McGowan, he had become president of the Philadelphia and Reading in 1869. A year later, they do the lease. And I can't think of a more, con a more iconic image than coal. That's a coal breaker. Uh, where they used to, you know, they mined the coal and then they would sort the coal in the breaker and then it would go into the coal cars according to the size and so forth. Anthracite coal, relatively clean burning for that time period, relatively clean. In any case, that is what is powering the industries of the United States at that time. That was considered the top coal. Now, um, so, and Gowan dreamed of a coal empire. There's a wonderful book you might want to read. It's called Franklin Gowan, Ruler of the Reading. And there's a lot of it has to do with the Molly Maguires and so on and so forth. But in terms of what's our interest, um, he hired Frank Furness, found out about them, and he started building stations on the Chesson Hill line. And so since I'm doing this, uh, more, really more geographically and not specifically uh, chronologically, 1878, I think, is the first one he did. That they Actually, one of the last ones is Gorgas on the right, but that's the only photo I've ever seen of it. Liz Jarvis found it. Okay, thanks. There you can see the location. And Mount Pleasant, by the way, later becomes Cedric. Go ahead. And there is Mount Pleasant as built by Furnace. So, and beautifully kept, as you can see on the left, but on the right, 1979 by me uh, on its last use. Let's put it that way. You notice the tarot, <laughs> almost medieval in appearance. Okay, keep going. There's Furnace in the 1880s, and that's pretty much the way he looked when he was designing stations for the Philadelphia Reading. And what's interesting, uh, Gowan discovered him by way of the Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts project. And PAFA, it took five years to build that. Furness is the chief architect, but he was also working in his office was the Hewitt brothers. So it's Furness and Hewitt. And um, Furness really did the structural design and the Hewitts did a lot of the decorative fancy work on the facade. We'll come back to that later. But I think Gowan loved the uniqueness. He loved the aggressiveness of the structure. In fact, he he I think he thought that Frank Furness was a kindred spirit to his entrepreneurial spirit himself. And Furness was a kind of a roguish guy. He had been a cavalry officer in the Civil War. Let's not forget that. Now, what's interesting here is. Mount Airy Station is the next one on the line. It's still extant, amazingly. It's still there, 1882. And the reason I remember the coal, uh, the breaker that I showed with the uh, in the lithograph, but watch this. Now, this was brought up by George Thomas in a book on Furnace, uh, dealing with Frank Furnace and the, and the age of the great machines. And he made mention of the fact that he said, oh, it looks similar to a coal breaker. Now, he didn't show a photograph, but I did. Uh, because if you look at the roof line of the structure and then you look at the roof line of the shed, it almost appears in some slightly um, playful way that what Furness actually did was a scale model of a coal breaker. And what better place to do that as a railroad station as the station where the president of the railroad, whose whole life was about coal, happens to get on every day. He lived within a few hundred feet of there. Go ahead. Now there it is as finished, absolutely pristine with all its textural richness that you would ever have. Go ahead. 1914, doesn't really look very much different. By the way, that's Gowan Avenue was the overpass. There's the close up. Go ahead. 
Now, later, you'll notice something and say, oh, uh, what happened to the sloping shed? It's bent. Yes, it is bent because what happened in the meantime, and then I think it was in the 20s, for certain reasons of operations, the railroad raised the grade level and they elevated the tracks to match the station and there wasn't enough room to get the passenger cars underneath without hitting the shed. So rather than cutting the shed off, they did an interesting innovation. They simply altered the shape. They bent the shed. Look at the difference. There's the original straight shot, and then on the right, the bent form. Okay. And the other thing to notice, just one more time, uh, look at the difference in grade change, how you walked up about, what is it, seven or eight steps to get in. It's elevated and very dramatic. And on the right, you walk straight in. Some people might remember walk a crooked mile books used to be in there for many, many years. Okay, um, Mount Airy, wonderful station, still surviving, 1898 and then 2019. And there is Gowan's house, also designed by Furness. And it's right below the pond where that little cul-de-sac is. And then you see the Mount Airy station location. All that's built over by houses now. Moving north, Mermaid Lane, built in 84, demolished in 30. Okay. And on the right, there you see when they're getting ready to tear it, 1917 on the left, 30 on the right. Good. And uh, these are some stations. That's probably the last moment of Mermaid Lane. Uh, go ahead. And uh, you'll notice what they were doing was take, look at how close between stations they really are. Some of them are only like a third of a mile. And there were a lot of grade crossings. Go ahead. There's Windmore. And at the grade crossing, you either had a gate, and by the way, they were not automatic gates. They had to be hand cranked, which meant a live person had to walk out and hand crank the gate down, or he could use a flag, just like the fellow on the left. But the Great Crossing Elimination Project eliminated all that. Go ahead. And you can see the difference in the next shot. Yeah, go ahead. Look at the difference between a Great Crossing, which, and the separated grade. And of course, yes, it speeds up the traffic or the train traffic. It also means that cars don't have to stop anymore. And frankly, most people don't even know there's a train up there unless they're really focused on it. Okay, that's the way it looks pretty much today. And you know, it's hard to believe though, that facade, that is 90 years old. I know it looks modern, but that's really finished somewhere in, I think in early 1933 during the electrification project. Okay, Reading Company. And uh, going further, Winmore, there's, there it is today up on the track level, go ahead, and the last shots of Winmore. Okay, now, I want to change the plot here very briefly. And so we're looking at the east line, and then I want to jump to the west line, because it's exactly at this moment that the competitor enters the scene, right? We love competition. Some people do. The Pennsylvania Railroad, not to be outdone ever, uh, felt that the Cheston Hill area was, yes, a lucrative commuter uh, railroad could be built there with houses. Only they weren't going to wait for 30 years for those houses to be built. They were going to do it in one big shot. But we'll look at that. But there you see, that's my little schematic map there. In orange, it's the Pennsylvania Railroad lines west. And on the yellow line are the... Uh, uh, Reading slides. Okay, go ahead. Now, in order to reach Cheston Hill, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad is, is actually a little farther away because they would have been leaving then from Broad Street Station near City Hall. And they go up through the um, west side of the Schuylkill River, cross the Schuylkill near the zoo, and then they did a beeline across the city of Philadelphia. And that is the main line to New York. It's still used today. That is That would be the Amtrak main line to New York, uh, right at North Philadelphia. And uh, that was built in 1867. It was called the Connecting Railroad. You notice it's straight. And the reason it's straight, because when they built it, there was hardly anything up there. It was all open land. 
And there's the 1885 map. And you can see now the old Reading line passing underneath the Pennsylvania line. And you also see this big arcing swing coming around. And that's the Pennsylvania line fanning off and now paralleling the Reading line. And by the way, if you look in this photograph way to the left, there's that early, early little 16th Street station of the PG&N still standing. There it is. But this is like about 1880. Actually, the photo was 1890. Yeah, it's 18. It's it was put in in 84, but it, the photo is 1890. Probably taken by Ralph. Now, okay, this really spells it out. Those are the original sketches of the Cheston Hill stations on the west side by Washington Blood and Powell, the architect that Henry Houston used to build, to design those stations. And that's Houston on the right. And Houston, actually Houston originally was with the Pennsylvania Railroad but way back, even before the Civil War. And then later in 1867, he left the railroad and he went on, he was in iron working, he was in steamships, he was in everything, a real Renaissance man in terms of industrial entrepreneurship. But then he became so wealthy, the Pennsylvania Railroad asked him to come back, but, the, but this time on the board of directors. Okay, so the president, they wanted him to be on the board of directors, and that was in the late 70s. And as soon as he got there, he said, oh, I have a plan to develop land in, uh, along the Wissahickon Creek. And in fact, he bought 3,000 acres of that. And uh, I think it's 3,000 or is it 5,000? It's at least 3,000 acres. In fact, at one point, he was the largest single landowner in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, because by that time, by the way, Chestnut Hill was now part of Philadelphia. I forgot to mention that 1854, you already know that in hell. So in any case, but he wanted to do a planned, a planned community. Now, starting with the stations, the first station out from German, it was called Germantown Junction, is Westmoreland. And uh, it was built in 1884. I mean, it stood till way into the 1950s, so, but it is gone. It went uh, a long time ago. You'll notice it's one story. Look at Queen Lane on the right, as built, brand new. Also one story. Now that building is still there because I saw it recently, but it's two story. And we'll come to that later. Go ahead. This one, Shelton Avenue, but on the grade level, look at those big crossing gates, hand cranked, I might add. Um, but that that is gone now only as of, uh, well, actually as of 1918. But that was a singular design. That was not part of the standard design. So what Powell did, out of 10 stations that he designed, seven were built to an identical plan. They were standardized. Why? Pennsylvania Railroad was, remember, called the standard railroad of the world. Standard locomotives, standard bridges. Okay. But that one was unique. That's a shot right before it came down. It's behind the tool shed. You notice they've already built a brand new underpass for the railroad, and the station is left high and dry, and then they get rid of that, and then they build a new one. Now, to the right. Topolhawken, 1906, 2019. You notice by that time they're two-story. I'm going to show you specifically how that was done. Upsell is next. Now, these are dwelling stations that with a live-in station agent and his family. That's why they built the second story. My favorite shot of Upsell. Probably, well, it's after 1894 and it's before 1906. Just a great shot. That one is a uh, carpenter. I remember in the 79, I foolishly forgot to shoot the whole station. Maybe the light was wrong, but it did get the chimney. Look at that chimney. So yeah, they may be standard, but that is a masterpiece of a chimney. Look at that chimney. It looks like a locomotive smokestack. Yeah, anyway. That's a shot that uh, Liz Jarvis discovered. Oh, it's unbelievable. That is Carpenter, but as a single story station, which means it's before 1890. Allen Lane. 
as built in 1884 as a one-story station and 2019 is a two-story. Now, all right, this is it. Now, this came from a book from 1893 called Buildings and Structures of the Monacan Railroads by Walter Burr, which I actually lucky to have a copy of the original, but there was reprinted later. And I copied this, and that is Alan Lane, the plans from the railroad as built. It's the only time I've ever seen it. And the end view. Now, next slide. Okay, now watch this. The image on the left is Alan Lane. And the image on the right, in point of fact, is actually Queen Lane. But since they're identical, you can see the transformation from the story and a half to the two-story in that one drawing. There it is. One picture's worth a thousand words. Okay? And that's the way they remain. So what that really means is when you look at a station like Allen Lane today, you're looking at something from at least 1892, 130 years old, it hasn't changed except for the jump over the bridge. That was added in 1912. There's the postcard in 06 without the bridge. In 1912, they added the bridge. Keep going. That's one of my favorite pieces. I love it. That's my favorite station on the West Lawn. That's my own personal opinion. I think Alex grew up there as restored in the right. Okay, there's the full line. And the, the only thing I would mention, you'll notice the Fort Washington branch cut off right off the Chestnut Hill line, a little beyond Ellen Lane. It's abandoned now. Okay, go ahead. There's the original Crescent Valley Bridge, the steel bridge, which lasted until very recently. I'm not sure exactly when it was replaced. Uh, I took that shot on the right, but it's really not a good time of the year to do it. Uh, but today it looked beautiful driving under there. It's wonderful. But it's a cast, cast country bridge. Now, St. Martin's is next. Earlier, I had a drawing, which I'm going to have to make another copy of, but that is St. Martin's in, 90, uh, well, the photo was probably taken in 09, but it was renamed in 06 by the, uh, the Woodwards. Now, uh, but it was built as Wissahickon. So in my 1884 timetable, it says Wissahickon. In 94, it says Wissahickon Heights, probably to reflect the fact that by that time, Houston had already built the housing development. So it became known as Wissahickon Heights until 1906, and then it's changed to St. Martin's. Go ahead. It was originally built as stone. So that was also a unique station on the West Line. And then amazingly, in 1889, they rebuilt it to be the two story, they actually took some of the stone down in order to do a complete brick second story. It, it's amazing that that was done. Uh, I have a couple of interior shots, and I have to admit, they were shot through the window because we couldn't get in the door. But look at the close up here. I'll take the next shot. Now, look at the fireplace, and above the fireplace is some beautiful glazed plaques. That's a book that influenced American design for uh, quite a number of years. It's by Charles Locke Eastlake and influence household design, exterior and interior and furniture. And that image, the lithograph is from the book, but look at how similar the tile, not the same, but they're similar, the tile facings, because it's built in that time period. Okay. There you have Houston, by the way, he was born in 1820. By the time he developed the Wissahickon Heights, he was already well into the 60s. And there's George Hewitt, architect on the right. I don't have a photo of his brother, unfortunately. But there they are. And the reason why Houston used Hewitt, we come back to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And they, remember, they worked with uh, Furnace, they did a lot of the decorative work. Furnace did mostly the structural design, but it was the Hewitts that did the fancy work, especially on the facade, which you can see today, right now. And Houston really liked that. In fact, he said, oh, that's the ecclesiastical design. I like that. And he had them design the Wissahickon Inn Hotel, which later became the Chestnut Hill Academy. That is actually opened even before they finished the houses or even the railroad stations. It's still there, obviously. 
Uh, okay, Glenn, there it is in 1903. And then I walked around it in 2019 and did a lot of close-up shots because I think it's just a fantastic hat building. And it's very, mm, it's kind of indicative of what they call Queen Anne because Queen Anne is really a sort of an offshoot of Eastlake style. There you see open ground where they have yet to build houses. Go ahead. Yeah, the first ones are going up. There's the cricket club, at least the first cricket club, and then the St. Martin in the fields, Episcopal Church, and the wonderful interior shots. This is all Hewitt, and what they call the Sabor House. There it is when it's new, and that was the sample house for the housing development. And the initial contract was 80 houses. So the Hewitts were very busy guys. By the way, I think they later went on to design the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. Correct me if I'm wrong. I just thought of that now. That's still down there. It's big. But anyway, um, Drum Moore, of course, that's, um, you know, uh, that would be Houston's own house. It looks like the Castle of Toronto. It's fantastic. I had the gardens in later years. Now, remember that Houston was not the president of the railroad. He did have a lot of power, a lot of influence, but he wasn't the president. He was the president, George B. Roberts. Incidentally, Roberts is the one that named a lot of the mainline stations with Welsh names that we all know, like Bryn Mawr and uh, Lanark and, uh, you know, uh, Narberth and all that. But in any case, What's interesting is there had been housing developments before. Uh, I'm sure Houston would have been aware of uh, Ridley Park, which had been done 10 years earlier. Also a railroad and a housing development. And that's another story. Go ahead. So where would you get on the train? You have to remember something. When, when the Pennsylvania line was built, departing Philadelphia was already grade separated, you went out from Broad Street Station right across from City Hall, you were already up on the elevated viaduct, which I remember in later years was referred to as the Chinese Wall. I actually saw the Chinese Wall, but I was very young, very young. But in any case, uh, and there's the track level, you can see they're actually were still working on City Hall at that time. Go ahead. There's a, that's not the very first timetable, but it's the oldest one I have. It's from, uh, I think it's August of 1884. And actually, when you check the departure time and arrival, it's not that much different today. It's only minutes off. I think it's like 38 minutes. It's still that way. It fluctuates a little bit. And the reason is because they designed it right to begin with. There were few grade crossings, and you can only make so much speed between those station stops anyway. Okay, so in spite of the technology, it takes about the same amount of time right now as it did in 1884. Now, I love the little time. That those are pocket timetables, and they were issued to women, mostly, for shopping. And you'll see compliments of Strawbridge and Clothier Department Store, which was there even then, as was Wanamaker's, and so on and so forth the great age of department stores. So at first, they're trying to lure people to come on to Chester Hill. But now they want to bring people from Chester Hill to come into Philadelphia to shop and then, of course, go back home again. But I mean, you could do that because it only takes 38 minutes. And there's a lot of trains at that time, a lot of trains. Now, after 1893, that's what Broad Street Station looks like. And interestingly enough, the designer of the extension is Frank Furness. The same Frank Furness, who only a few years earlier was designing stations for the Reading. In between, he also did the BO station, but that's another story. There's the, the great train shed. Go ahead. Now, so continuing up the railroad towards Chestnut Hill, uh, we have Highland, now only a shelter shed. Uh, that was the first one to go. There's the grade crossing with a steam engine and one car on my net. No, it's more than one car. Anyway, and there's an MU. Go ahead. And that's the only photo I ever found of Highland Avenue as a full station, not a shelter shed. But you'll note it, it's down as of 1917 when they raised the street, but the Victorian house is still there. Same house in the photo. Coming into the yard, they had a turntable, not a roundhouse, but a turntable. 
and there's an early Punsy engine coming in. You can actually see the turntable if you look carefully uh, on the map. That's a 1910 map. Go ahead. Look at how closely Powell adhered to his original pen and ink design. There's Justin Hill. And in fact, it actually doesn't look very much different today. Of course, the train shed's gone. The only difference is basically the steeple is gone. Go ahead. There's a postcard in 1900, 2019. Ah, the trees are in the way, but that's okay. Keep going. You see that? There it is. There's the steeple. The steeple is gone. I wonder if it could ever be restored. Who knows? Okay, now when you stand up on the Germantown Avenue, okay, looking down, ah, no, before we get to that, this is very rare. This is the only photo I have ever, ever seen under the Iron Train Shed at Chestnut Hill. But look at that manicured lawn. It's fantastic. That's also the only photo I ever saw of a steam locomotive actually under the shed. It's not a great photo. It's the only one. There's what happens later in the electric era. No more turntable. Keep going. Then and more or less now. Okay, now, ah, there's the red cars from 1918. The Pennsylvania Railroad, the, the, the Chestnut Hill Railroad is the second line on their line to be electrified. First is the Paoli Local in 1915, Philadelphia to Paoli, electrified. And then in 1918, during the First World War, if you can believe it, they electrified the Chestnut Hill West Line. And as soon as they do that, no more steam engines, not for passengers. And you'll notice the shed goes. And so they use these M, what they call MU car, multiple unit MP54, 54 feet inside the car. Out the sign. How many people see that sign, the Keystone sign in gold leaf saying Chestnut Hill? It's not even 10 feet away from me right now. It's inside the Conservancy over the doorway in original gold leaf with patina doesn't get any better than that. If you're a collector, it doesn't get any better than that. Now, very rare shot from Germantown Avenue looking west. There's the station. There's the shed bridging the tracks. Only shot I've ever seen of it in 1914. There it is, uh, probably around 1960 without the shed. There it is, 14 again, with the shed. Also, one of the best shots I've seen of the Crescent Valley Bridge, photographed by Frank Tatnall in 1960, the red MP54. The, they used to call them owl eye because they had round porthole windows. Okay. These are by Frank Tatnall, the shot on the right, St. Martin's. Oh, absolutely the quintessential photo of St. Martin's. And that was taken. And, uh, well, it was right after John F. Kennedy took his own It was within days of that in 1961. Yeah. So that's the Chestnut Hill West Line. And now we're going to finish up by finishing the last few stations on the uh, Chestnut Hill East. So we're going to go back on the timetable, go back a mile away. And now we're approaching, there you see the turret. Uh, above the trees of Graver. Look at that turnout, which is long gone, by the way. Go ahead. There's Furnace again in his feisty vest. And there you have, at least my own opinion, I think that's his masterpiece, at least in terms of Chestnut Hill. Like, there's nothing like it. And there it is, complete as finished. You notice one track at that time and a long wooden platform. The, the second track is added in uh, 1902, actually, as late as that. So what you have here, uh, that's a little later in 1914, looking south, uh, also 1914, look at the gardens. The Reading Railroad was so interested in maintaining a beautiful look to their stations at their height that they actually had greenhouses at Wayne Junction with professional gardeners growing plants, and they would ship those plants out to all the stations on the entire system, which, of course, was mostly in eastern Pennsylvania, but even so. Now, in later years, unfortunately, during the 60s, between snow, windstorms, and whatever, 
the shed came down and it looks pretty bad. It's like an elephant without its trunk. And it was like that for a lot of years. Keep going. In fact, that's how I first saw it. Those shots were taken by me in 1979. And the way I actually got into this in 1979 was the idea that they wanted to restore the train shed. And I, I met Elizabeth Holloway and they said, oh, we need to save the station. We need to restore the shed and we need a fundraiser. Could you do a slideshow? Yeah, I'll do a slideshow. And of course, that's Kodachrome slides. I also happen to have the original photo, which the architect said he could make a drawing of. They had the footings, but he actually made mechanical drawings for that shed from my original glass plate photograph. It was a miracle he did it. And this is before computers. This is, there's no Photoshop. This is ink on linen. You have to remember that. 45 years ago. Okay, go ahead. So it was done. They did restore it. Look at the textural differences. That's as built. This is later, but you know, I love the way this thing looks. It's it's kind of a cross between a Germanic medieval castle. Uh, by the way, that's the original plan. It's just an elevation view. It's only schematic. Go ahead. The close up there, it's almost like a cuckoo clock. And that's but that's furnace. That's furnace and it's wildest because he doesn't restrain himself. His own teacher, uh, Richard Morris Hunt, even said, yeah, he says Frank had a way of uh, making a caricature out of every building. And that's even when he was a student. And then his protege, who was uh, Louis Sullivan, said, oh yeah, Frank Furness, every building he built had a personality. It's almost as if you could talk to it. And I thought about that. That's, by the way, one of my favorite shots of Graver's. I've never seen anything like it. Go ahead. You see the textural stuff. So every station was unique. And what's interesting, on the Pensy side, most of them are the same. But on the Reading side, no two are alike. And why? Because Frank Furness even said, oh, with my stations, you don't have to look at the sign to know where you're at. You'll know it by the shape. 1898 on the left. 2019, oh, sorry, 1914, 2019 on the right. What can I say? I walked over there the other day and it still looks great. And actually it was like walking through a piece of sculpture. I thought I had died and going to heaven. The miracle is we're talking about something that's 140 years old, 140. And there it is 140 years ago on the right. And here it is more or less today. And the fact of the matter is how many places can you think of where you can use an industrial object that is 140 years old? Not many. One is the Brooklyn Bridge. I think there's still vehicular traffic. 1883, the same year that this was built, the Brooklyn Bridge was built. Same year, still in use. But there it is, and that is, I think, its masterpiece. Keep going. We're just going to go into Chesson Hill and finish. Obviously, the houses reflected the later era the French mansard style, shingle style, uh, Queen Anne, and on and on. Oh, yeah, I know. The art museum. Woodmere. Woodmere. Oh, masterpiece. Yeah. And of course, by this time, you're leaving from Reading Terminal. Opened in January 1893. Still there. The building is still there. The trains are underground, of course, now. But it's still, even the shed has survived. It's a miracle. Go ahead. Inside the shed, uh, and steam coming in the Chestnut Hill. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. There is the 1871 station. Okay. And that was, uh, it's Reading. It's right after the PGN uh, leased. But there it was. It was still there in 1930. Go ahead. And an old friend of mine, his name was Ed Alexander. He's long gone. He wrote a book in 1940. And he said, for you model railroaders out there, if you really want to do a beautiful little railroad model yard, Chesson Hill is the best one to do it. And he featured that in his 1940 book right there. Got it. And he actually took that shot of the roundhouse. In fact, that's his car sitting there in 1930. And he's on Bethlehem Pike right there. Both those shots at Alexander. That's a railroad shot looking into the sheds. I only included this one because that thing was actually built for the Philadelphia Germantown and Norristown. And other than old iron sites, it's the only photo I could find of a locomotive built for the PG&A by Baldwin, very rare, 1854. The same year, 
that the Chestnut Hill line was open. That's on the turntable. Here's another one in the shed in Chestnut Hill. This is later in 1930. There's one of the suburban tank engines coming out of the yard. Got it. So then the electrification project happens between 1930 and 33. Go ahead. In fact, they actually were building the new station, and there's the remains of the wall of the old one in the background. You see that? Go ahead. Then and now. And those are the electric cars they used. They were built by uh, Harlan and Hollingsworth, owned by Bethlehem Steel. In uh, oh, love that shot on the reservoir. Uh, Alex took us there with the walking tour, and that's the Reading MU cars that they used until very recently. Go ahead. There's some various shots of the MUs. There's one at Gravers. Go ahead. And there we are. Uh, some people call that collegiate gothic. That's a 1930s sort of a Gothic revival, not the original Gothic, but revival. There's the old station on the left, Bethlehem Pike, looking down the pike, go ahead, looking up, look at that touring car, unbelievable, towards Chestnut Hill. And that's it, that's the tour. But the final thing here is without these books, nothing. That's all I can say. So first of all, those four on the bottom, uh, three of them are Liz Jarvis is involved, and who is Judith? Uh, what's her name? Can I holler? Collard. Uh, wonderful books. They're the best ones that give you the flavor, that give you the ambience of this kind of ecosystem of rail, station, architecture. It's wonderful. Without those books, you don't get the feel of this place. But in terms of studying Frank Furness, well, actually, I was at the show in 1973 at the Philadelphia Art Museum, and that is when Frank Furness comes back to life after years of obscurity. When he died in 1912, I hate to say it, most people didn't even remember he had ever been an architect. And he was more or less forgotten all through the 40s and 50s until 1973 when O'Gorman, uh, George Thomas, and High Myers did that catalog and they did a big show at the Philly Art Museum. They had furniture, they had architectural drawings. That was great. And, and there's a couple other books too uh, that you don't want to miss out. There's a whole uh, library of stuff plus original source documents. It's taken me a lot of time of going through this data. And I might have made a mistake here and there, but uh, by and large, I, okay, that's it. Any questions, I don't know, whatever, however you want to do this. Thank you. Oh, okay. Ted, that was amazing. I had lived. That was yeah, amazing. Yeah. Really right, exciting well presentation. Done, Ted. Well done, thank well, you thank so you. much. Um, I want to mention that the Images of America books that you were talking about are actually available and at the Conservancy for Purchase. Um, so uh, we're going to now turn it over to uh, Jean McCubrey um, to um, bring some questions forward. But I do see that Bob Previtti has raised his hand. I, I yield to Bob because I don't see any questions in the chat box yet. Okay. So my question is actually for Ted. <clears throat> Ted, if you've got yeah. any information in... in over the years, I'd like to have a sense. I'm looking for ridership numbers for these lines. So if you or anybody else that you know, I'm looking for some historical ridership data about how the lines have been doing over the years. So um, well, wonderful presentation, by the way. Do it. It's, it's really, really they, well done. Actually, there, there is a place for the ridership data. And amazingly, it's in the, annual, the old annual reports. Now, in fact, I bought in eBay, I'm always buying things from eBay, but I got an 1855 Philadelphia, Germantown, and Norristown annual report. I didn't bring it with me, but they actually give you the ridership month by month and year by year. And I was astounded to see that even then they had like 500,000 people going back and forth to Germantown even in the year 1855, I found it hard to believe. 500,000 tickets sold. And then in Cheston Hill, which they had only just finished, it was between 20 and 30,000, but there was more to come. Now, this is over the whole year, of course. 
and a lot of them are yeah short trips. Okay. Well, of course we could talk offline, but Yeah. I'd love to get together with you and, and look look dig out some Yeah, of that and ridership you can do the numbers same with and the publish Pepsi. it. The, the, those annual reports actually give you the number of passengers that they sold tickets to. That that makes sense And to that's me. Is hot. that makes sense to me? I'd like to see that. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Anybody else? Susan and I are wondering about the transport of daily goods, so to speak. I know there were cattle yards at St. Martin Station, for example, or not not a yard, but like a shed for livestock and so stuff like that. What what would how what was going on with shipping things out like? Food. Well, you know, the, okay, as far as St. Martin's, uh, that one is a new one on me, and I'm finding things out every day. But I will tell you, there was quite a coal yard in Chestnut Hill on the east side. Right, In fact, it was right next to the old Chestnut Hill station, that, that, that 1870s one I showed you. There was a coal yard there. You'll notice, by the way, there was a small turnout. Remember, as we were approaching Graver's Lane, and I just said, look, the turnout. I didn't really make much mention. But that means that curved track was going to somebody who, who had an unloading platform. So there was milk offloading. There were coal yards all the way up and down the line. And I've got a lot of photos of them. And the only reason I didn't include them, it, we, we, this show, if I included those shots, it would be as long as a Richard Wagner uh, opera. Because, the, yes, it's all there. Uh, in fact, the Reading Railroad, one of the reasons they wanted that 9th Street line, they wanted the coal yard outlets and industries that were all there. That was a perfect place to sell their coal. That's what they were selling. But um, so the freight operations, there were a lot of shippers and customers along the lines. We were focused on the passenger stations and the passenger operation and the architecture of that. But you're right. There's a very rich history of the freight. It's not as well publicized, I might add. And the structures are not, you know, they're not like celebrity structures. So everybody looks at a passenger station, and how many people pay attention to a freight house? Well, I actually do, but uh, that's the problem there. You have to dig into it and look at the annual reports. You look at with one of the best sources I found, and I found about this many years ago. In the First World War, the United States government actually took over all of the railroads in the United States just for the time of the war. And they called it the USRA, the United States Railway Administration. And as soon as they took control, the first thing they did, they demanded an inventory of every single thing that existed on every railroad. Well, when I got inside the Reading Company vault in 1975, I was shown the book, they were called the Book of Valuations. They had written material, some sketches, and lots of photos. And there it was, interior shot. They, they even listed something like a trash can at a desk, if you can believe this. But that's government for you. That's what they do. And so, but from a historian's point of view, it's priceless. They even had photographs, exquisite photos of outhouses, if you can believe it, because it was part of the property. So whatever existed, coal yards, freight turnouts, uh, everything that had to do with the engine terminals, it was all there. Ferry boat operations, which I haven't even barely mentioned. Uh, so you can find it if you have and want to spend the time. It is there. Go ahead. Um, I have a couple of questions came in that may be more for um, perhaps for Bob. But one is, how do we encourage more people to go back to taking trains? <laughs> um, I think we have to talk about it. I think it's a real challenge. Uh, we've been doing a little bit of research, and uh, some people have dived into census data. And not a surprise, car ownership is very high in the Northwest. So I, I think that's why I'm very careful about how I'm phrasing it. 
you know, I, I like to talk about that. We are a progressive, forward thinking community that worries about the environment, reducing CO2. And I, I take the train and the bus everywhere. When I go out to Chicago to work, which I have um, for the last couple of years, I, I don't rent a car. I literally take the public transit system. Yeah. And what I when I went to Chicago, I really realized that we are creatures of habit. Yeah. And we do what the people around us are doing. And I'm afraid that we see each other driving and we are pounded day in and day out yeah. with advertising yeah. saying that you really can't live your life without a car. And I don't think we realize how much we've been hoodwinked. And actually listening to Ted's fantastic speech, I really, I st mm -hmm. listened closely to the amount of change mm -hmm. that has occurred. That each and every one of these buildings was one story and now it's two stories. And so I guess I'm going to ask everybody on this committee because we, this is a group that knows our history. So now my challenge for you is how can we take these two fantastic and gorgeous resources and reactivate them? And not just on a small scale, but on a big scale. I mean, I've always, even when I was the head of the business association and we did these reports um, at the Chestnut Hill vision study, and I had some traffic studies done. Mm -hmm. And they say that what makes this place great is its walkability. I look at the board, this, I could still call it the borders site, and it's got a two-story building on it. I mean, that site should be a six-story building. It's between two train stations and the 23 ends there. I mean, if we're going to put density, we should put density where it encourages public transit use and reduce the parking requirements so we don't attract people who drive there and clog up the streets, that we actually attract people who want to live in a place like this and with less parking uh, available. But we've got to figure out I want to look at the history. I would love people's help on looking at the history of the ridership, the history of the development. I know I've, I, I've worked in City Hall. I know developers would jump at the chance if a community like this laid out a vision for what sites would be appropriate to develop. And, and that development, we think about how to encourage transit use. I think it's it's really on all of us right now because we can't just look at the past. We've got to look at the future and what are the adaptive reuses. And I know SEPTA has got an RFP on the street now for some of the some of the station houses. You know, they want to try to activate them. I think it's too small scale. I think we need to go bigger. We don't have to be, we don't have to build the Empire State Building, but you know, some Something that's going to generate energy and excitement for the kind of energy and excitement that Ted just expressed about the history of how this place grew. Thank that, you. That's so that's what I would recommend. That's great. That makes a lot of sense. Um, the I just wanted to mention one uh, re related. Well, it's related to uh, the history of development near the train stations, and this question is how quickly were apartment buildings and row homes built near the train stations in Chestnut Hill and Mount Airy? And was it zoning that prevented more of them after the 1920s? So that's perhaps a question for, um, I don't, Ted, I don't know if you know. No, not me. The real estate <laughs> I don't know that one. Okay. I have a bit of that, Jean. Um, I would say uh, starting around World War I, uh, we had apartment, uh, buildings starting to go up near the train station. So near uh, Allen Lane Station is uh, the Cresham Apartments. Uh, I think that went up around 1914. And then um, 
especially in the boom of the 20s, uh, we had quite a number that went in uh, near Upsol and Tolpoc. And, and one reason for that is that there are still large, into the 20s, still large single um, family uh, estates that had very large parcels that could be developed with apartment buildings. And um, coupled with that is the line, uh, the Chestnut West line um, was electrified in 1918. Uh, and one thing that was sort of, it's sort of weeding, um, but the electrification allowed uh, the line to have more frequent service. Mm -hmm. And that would be uh, much more attractive to those commuting to and from Center City. Um, and uh, the apartment buildings would be a, a way to address um, increased demand, uh, you know, higher ridership levels um, and a greater interest in living in the Northwest. And then, of course, there is the uh, other um, uh, second boom in the 50s uh, with apartment buildings going in. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? I, I have a, a in the chat box, there are several um, comments that are more, there are more comments than questions. Um, do we have time for uh, at least one or two more of these that are really questions? Yeah, I would go through them. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, this is one about the fate of the Fisher's Lane station. Only an outbound pavilion remains. Any idea of its construction date or how to research that? Did you have a date on that, Ted? I can't remember. The, uh, I mean, the, station, the station that I showed photos of was built in 1875. It is down. That is that is, The old one is gone. I don't know the precise year, so I, I don't want to pin myself down, but I know okay. that one of the sheds was removed not too long ago. Go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. the... The original station building, well, I shouldn't say original, but that built in 72 was demolished in uh, 1983 uh, during actually oh. the regional rail uh, strike when people sort of weren't watching. It was, I believe, over that summer. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, the sh the canopies, I believe, also were built in 1875, yep. including yep. the one that was just taken down. Just taken down, yep. Um, let's see. And this is, this is also, um, a question. Um, I've heard that some stations were going to be transformed into restaurants. Any truth to that? Well, is Allen Lane still a coffee shop? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah. A, a very good one. Yeah, right. I've been by there. the way, yes, Ted, that's the station I grew up next to. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. And also, um, has SEPTA set a deadline for closing the line, or is it merely a threat at this time? Right now, uh, it, it is a threat because um, there is a lot of positive feedback from the Philadelphia delegation. Um, the budget is pretty good. I really like what the governor has laid out in his budget. He has made sure that this is not a Philly-only thing, but he has carefully outlined many, many public transit agencies throughout the state that need money. And he's made sure to let all those representatives know that. So this way, you know, Harrisburg isn't looked, uh, Philadelphia is not looked upon highly in Harrisburg, uh, but he's done a very good job of packaging it. So I do think, you know, and again, I please encourage everybody, you know, get in contact with your legislators. We need to keep that pressure on. The problem is it's going to be a one-time Band-Aid. We're going to have to figure out a structural way to fix this problem. So look for the save to the train effort to continue on that path. Um, but part of that also is figuring out um, how to get more ridership back. I did want to make one, one mention since we are talking about development. There's a lot of exciting plans around the North Philadelphia station, which I had occasion to take an Amtrak train home from New York and by golly, there was a Chesnaho West train that was meeting it. You know, I, I, I had like a, a seven minute wait. So I got off in North Philly. It was, the lights were broken. It was dark. The train showed up. I got home one hour earlier because of that North Philadelphia transfer. So 
I think we need to connect with that North Philadelphia station and reinvigorate that because I don't know about you, but cutting an hour's travel time to New York sounds good to me. Great. Uh, oh, I have one comment on the, um, or someone, someone, Suzanne Hansen can can comment on um, the RFP that SEPTA has for five of the historic stations. Suzanne, would you like to say something briefly? Can I unmute? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. Yeah. So uh, it's been in the works for a long time, but uh, since last fall, I guess. But then it had had it had actually been several years ago too that it was offered a, a, a re, um, request for bids to um, uh, develop this, some of the stations. But this time around, this new RFP involves five of the stations, three along the Chestnut Hill West Line and two on the Chestnut Hill East Line. Topahawken on the Topahawken, Upsal, and Carpenter on the west side. And uh, I got to think about the two on the east side. But uh, um, Ted did mention them. I'm very sorry that I can't I can't bring them to mind right now. But they're oh, all all five of them are historically are all five of them are historically designated too. And the idea behind it is they're gonna be uh, offered as a package so that one developer would take the lease on all of them. And in the, the with the idea being for those that are two story to create maybe an apartment above and have either, depending on the location of these stations, some are, you know, less visible than others. Topahawken Station, for instance, which I'm sorry Ted didn't mention, but that's between the Chelton Avenue Station and the top and the Upsal Station. Okay. Uh, but that, um, you know, that's kind of away from all traffic. So it, it's possible that something like that, you know, uh, would be something more like an architect's office or a business, uh, some kind of a, an office, as opposed to a retail space, although it's still possible. It's not, you know, uh, a developer could come up with some pretty good ideas. Um, so they're, they're, they're all in fact offered as a package and we're working, I am working closely with um, uh, some of the developers that are considering it. And um, so I'm hoping that they're, uh, uh, proposals will uh, meet the uh, SEPTA's uh, uh, requirements. I just got got a um, update that the two east stations are Mount Airy and Gravers. That's, cor that's correct. Thank you. Okay. okay. Can I say one thing? Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing that I forgot to say. It's a good thing because we'll never see anything like that again. They should take good care of those, whoever it is who takes care of them, because that's that's a once in a lifetime thing. There'll never be another structure like that again. It would be too expensive mm -hmm. to build. Mm -hmm. And it is what it is. Yeah, there so, is a developer that's uh, actually is owns or I should say uh, has this long term rental of the uh, uh, Richard Allen's Lane Station currently, and now it's the High Point Cafe. Um, he's looking, he's one of the developers that's looking to, uh, uh, submit a proposal for all of the others. And uh, yes, I see in the chat, it is yes. one of the, one of the, the one developer that, that, le that leases the Chestnut or the, uh, Allen's Lane, uh, um, station is Ken Weinstein. And he's done a very good job of adaptive reuse in historic in historic buildings. So he's one that we're uh, optimistic about that proposal. Yeah, Susan, we need to talk we need to talk to Ken about this too. One of the other ways, Gene, going back to the question earlier, 
about how could we get ridership back a little bit more. You know, the hourly service is an issue. We should probably all fight to get the schedules shifted so that they're not leaving at the same time. You know, they keep acting like these are still two competing railroads, which is silly. Uh, that would help. Uh, but also, I, I want to talk to Ken about getting a bus shelter at Wayne Junction for the 23. Because when you miss a train, I do this now. I, I get off at Wayne Junction, wait on the corner for the 23, and then bang, I'm up here. And I'm back up here before I would have boarded the train. You know, there's no reason to wait. I also encourage people, you know, uh, to take the Broad Street to Olney and take the L bus. Yeah. There, there are alternatives, and they're actually not that bad. Um, so we need to try to encourage people to, we need to educate people and encourage them to use them. Great. I think we, we have to wrap it up. Um, I think, I don't know about you all, but I, I could probably talk about trains for another hour, but we do have to call it a night. Um, and the, I assume the, the chats will be, the, the questions and comments in the chat will be part of the recording. Chrissy, is that true? Yes. Okay, great. So um, anyone who registered for this uh, event will have access to the recording. Yes, as will all Conservancy members. Okay, so I, I hope you can enjoy it again. And um, thanks so much, Ted and Bob and Alex and everyone else. <laughs> Thank yes, you. Thank Please you join all. us. To, join us on uh, next Monday to come come for a ride to Harrisburg. It'll be fun. David trained up. Thank you very much, Ted, Chrissy, Jean, Bob, Alex, and thanks to everyone um, for for staying with us tonight. And Liz, for all the books that you wrote that helped to guide. <laughs> Um, which are available at the Conservancy. And yes. if you time it right and she's working, she'd probably sign them for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All, All right. right. Remember that for um for the holidays. <laughs> or have a great night, everyone. We hope to Good see night. you. Good night. Good night.